Okay, so you all know me, but my name is Gavin Nielsen, and this is the modeling simulation analysis uh, seminar. This is day 10 of 11 days. So we're getting almost to the end. <clears throat> we're going to finish our physical modeling today. Um, so this is the, the last day we're going to push, pull, we're going to connect everything together, which is not the best way to do it. It's just the way it kind of turned out. Um, but yeah, so, and my name is Gavin Nielsen. Did I say that already? Okay, good. Means we're on the same page. Okay, so <clears throat> same same old thing. We've, we've been through all this stuff. Today's physical modeling number two, and then there's a final seminar next week, and we'll call it good. Um, what we're going to do today is talk a little bit more about fidelity. Um, I don't know if we'll talk about top down design or just do it and then comment as we go. I think that's probably the way we'll do it. Um, <clears throat> Transduction, another fun word. I think we'll talk about that for just a second. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some Simulink concepts. And then we've got a lot of work to do inside Simulink to kind of build this thing out. And the main thing what we're doing is we're taking our SolidWorks 3D model and we're pulling that into, we're exporting it out of SolidWorks, pulling it into, into Simulink, and connecting all the dots so that we can talk to it with software. So that's kind of the big thing of today. And then we'll talk about refactoring fidelity. <clears throat> so, where do we start? Um, recall, way, 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 like first or second day, and we talked about the fidelity of models. And um, so, one thing we'll run into today, and, and I'll point it out when we're when we're there, is how accurate do we make this thing? You know, we could make it where it's accurate down to the picosecond, or we could we could just wave our hands and say, there's pressure here and as much flow as you want, and everywhere in between. Um, so if we think about it from starting at a high fidelity standpoint, someone might argue, hey, that's the place to do, because then you can just reduce everything to what's useful, because um, you, you know what you're cutting, basically. On the other hand, you could say we could start low and then just add what we need and save time. Um, but every project is different, so I can't tell you, okay, do this. Um, but I'm just communicating my general rule of thumb, so you can quote me, and this is just Gavin Nielsen's point of view. Um, I say start with what you've got on the shelf. It's easy. And then increase until some section is enough, or decrease until something is, I say, quote, similar, as in, like, you didn't degrade the characteristic of it too much that you cared about. Um, and that's kind of a nice, kind of rough algorithm to just have what is, you know, simple as you can mean. Uh, just get what you need. <laughs> and that's, you know, my, my, my personality is more like, oh, but look what we could learn if we added this. And that sometimes kills you, you know, like, because all that takes time. Um, so the key is to capture the effects that you built the model for, and that's where engineering requirements come in. And, you can look at something and say, this is why I'm spending these many hours. And I don't care about that, so I'm not going to model that, whatever it may be. So I, I wasn't in the Marines, uh, but I, I do like their their motto as far as modeling goes, simplify, you know, make it faithful. Don't, don't compromise something to make it simpler and then make it not faithful to what you need it to be. So it's a good, uh, good motto for modeling. Okay. Transduction, or transducer, what transducers do. Um, I just want to sort of generalize this in your minds, because um, I didn't, th when, I, when I heard transducer when I was uh, younger, it was always in the context of sensors, like, oh, I need a, a pressure transducer, or I need a voltage transducer, or whatever. But all it really means is a process of energy conversion. And last time we talked about, um, in Simscape, you have all these energy flows, and they're bi-directional. Uh, I can't remember. Were any of you guys here last time? You were. Okay. Uh, you were too here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, they kind of blend together, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so remember we were talking about bi-directional flows and how it, a real system pushes and pulls information or pushes and pulls energy. Um, and transducers, really what they do is convert forms of energy. So it's a really natural conversational 
thing to talk about here when we're talking about physical systems is that where do transducers fit? So there's two types of transducers. There's sensors and there's actuators. Um, I'm showing a picture of a, of a photo cell, right, a, like a solar panel, and that's a transducer of a type, right? It's converting solar energy to electrical energy. Um, but I didn't used to think about actuators as transducers, you know, of like a hydraulic motor that's taking fluid energy and converting it to mechanical energy. Um, and when we back up from this even a little more and say, wait a minute, we've got to go from software into the physical domain and back, we also need transducers there. And you know, um, so I'm not going to spend more on it than that. Just, just enough for you to tickle your brain on the topic. Um, it's kind of, in my head, it gets to be kind of a magical, like, how do we, how do we get there? It's like magic, you know, get into the next galaxy where things are virtual because they're physical here. Um, but that's, that's what transducers are for. So that's more of like, here's a word for you. And, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it helps enlarge my thinking. So that's why I mentioned it. Uh, then we're going to, we'll, we'll add some masks, uh, some pictures to our masks. Not a big deal. And you could look it up in the help file and we'll just do it once. But I wanted to show you just because the more abstract we get, the less a little bit of text on the mask helps. Sometimes you're like, hey, this is a, I don't know, pressure compensated flow control blah, blah, blah valve. Well, I could write that or I could put a picture of that and then someone who's familiar, oh, that's what that is. And it implies so much more. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about putting some masks on. Um, we're always abstracting because we want to be efficient. We want to solve a complicated problem and not think about it anymore. And uh, we've used in ports and out ports a lot. Um, I just will talk a little bit about physical ports. And that just allows you to take physical signals and pipe them in and out of a subsystem. And that's all there is to it. The nice thing is there's no in and out because they're bidirectional. Or generally, they're bidirectional. So you can use a connection port. You just sort of connect them to whatever domain you need, and they adapt themselves. Um, so that's kind of nice. So stop me if I'm going too fast, but I, I'm just getting through the boring stuff quick, and we'll get into the good stuff. So syndicate multibody. Um, do you guys know what rigid body motion is? Um, I mean, when I say it, just think about um, a skeleton, you know, moving. Think about the motion of a skeleton, and how when you when you think of that, you don't think about the bones bending, right? They're they're rigid infinitely rigid. And so rigid body motion is kind of that idea of a simulation that assumes things are infinitely rigid. And so it really ends up being a connection of different points translating and rotating. Um, that's what multibody is about, some simscape multibody. So it does, we can't, we can't really, uh, well, let me back up here for just a second. In simscape, pretty much everything is one dimensional. If you think about a circuit, you're pushing and pulling current, right? So push and pull, I'm kind of along a line. It's one dimensional. And if you have two circuits, you make two one dimensional things and they do what they need to do. Um, if you need to couple them, fine. Um, but that allows us to talk about it as an, as an ordinary differential equation, right? Like a, a function of one variable in time. Simula uh, Simulink is an ODE solver. So we can't really talk about partial differential equations within Simulink. So what allows us to do uh, the multi-body stuff is to assume that they're all rigid. Um, and then we talk about the motions and translations and rotations in time, because the structures themselves are not shifting in time. Um, so what multi-body does for us, and we'll talk about some more details, um, is basically abstract all of that computation from us because it gets complicated. Um, you can think about how do I how do I relate to my head to this um, bottle of water as it rotates and spins, and then I my body presses like this, and so my body gets pushed this way, and the body and the bottle gets pushed. It's complicated, right? And six degrees of freedom between the two things, and that's just two bodies. 
Um, so Simscape multibody allows us to kind of say how, however many bodies you need, I'll, I'll connect them for you. So the way it connects them is with these things called joints that we'll talk about. Um, and through those joints and other ways too, but that's kind of how we can actuate and sense things. Um, and also we can talk about it from a forward dynamics uh, point of view, like here's a torque, how fast are you going to spin? Or an inverse kinematics point of view, where you say, I want you to spin like this. What does that imply about the torque it would have taken to do that? So that's what, what those two things are talking about. Forward dynamics is, is uh, more often like the way you would spec a physical system. But inverse kinematics are helpful because you may not know, and we don't know, how big are three inch plate massive turrets, uh, how much torque that's going to take. And so we'll use inverse kinematics to figure that out and then drive it the right way with forward dynamics. Um, so we talked about why it's a little bit different. Um, it would seem like you could represent it as three single degree of, or six single degree of freedom systems. And so then they'd all be 1D. But the problem is that they're coupled in space. And so a rotation this way or a translation this way might affect the other thing. So you can't un unwrap that and make them completely independent. So any questions about that? It'll make more sense as we go. But okay. um, So I included the link here just because sometimes I, I have to go find it again every time I want to use this thing. There's a little utility that we're going to use called the Simscape multi-body link. Um, so that's that little... <clears throat> URLs where you can download it. It's free. Um, so you install it, and you install it in SolidWorks, and you also install it in Simulink, and that's what allows the two, and, and other CAD packages like Inventor and things like that. Uh, it connects to those two. And then we'll export our SolidWorks assembly out as an XML file, and then pull that back in to Simulink so that we don't have to, because there's a lot of details that uh, we don't want to be copying and um, messing up. Okay. So as I was going through the run-through, um, I realized um, there was one mate that we used last time. It's called assembly mates. It's, it's the same thing as a joint. Um, but in SOLIDWORKS, it's called a mate. And we used one called a width, I don't know if you guys recall, but to center the cannon inside the little uh, hole. And that width mate isn't supported. So that's going to kind of mess us up if we don't go fix it. So that's the first thing we need to do. And then we're going to define this as something that is supported, like coincident. And so let's get that out of the way now. this up. Slowly but surely. So here's our model. Sure, we'll rebuild it. Okay, just to remind you right now what our degrees of freedom are. We have one rotational degree of freedom there and another one here. Um, and if we look at our mates, this is the mate that's not supported, that width mate. So all I'm going to do is uh, I clicked on it once, left clicked, and I'm going to suppress that mate. And so if I left it suppressed, what that means is that this could move out. So now that it adds another degree of freedom. So we need to um, constrain that back. So I click on the mate tool. Okay. So now that will that will translate correctly for uh, um, <clears throat> for Simscape multibody. Okay. Now, now that, that was that was an easy fix, right? Um, I want to point something out that we're gonna. It's gonna be a pain later um, when it comes to control, but. 
I'm going to handle the control offline because it's uh, more than I want to talk about here. <laughs> um, but I just want to point something out. Um, and that's this is part of the power of doing it this way because you get to learn these aspects. But notice, where do you think the center of mass of this barrel is? I mean, roughly. Maybe in here somewhere. Maybe in. It's significantly to the left of this rotational axis, though, right? So when we drive this from a hydraulic and mechanical standpoint, it's going to want to tip down like a lot, right? I mean, this way, I can't remember how many thousands of tons, it was tens or hundreds of thousands of tons, right? So it's going to naturally have a torque down. So this system by itself is kind of unstable, um, which is going to be a little bit of a pain from a control point of view. So if I went and did this again, um, and when you actually kind of looked back at the pictures of uh, the way the, the barrel actually looks, there's all this mass over here, <laughs> which, or maybe you'd say that they just put the axis in a closer to the center of mass so you wouldn't just to counterbalance it. So not a big deal, but it's something that uh, is worthwhile to point out. OK, so how do we export? So I have, um, come on, save. I have Sim Mechanics Link installed. Um, and it's pretty easy to go through the tutorial. I won't bore you with that. So here's the, the menu for it. And first, I just want to look at settings real quick um, and just point a couple things out. So here's the settings for it. And it basically uh, lets you set some tolerances, um, round offs, things like that when you translate. Um, you can choose the geometry file format that it's going to export in. Um, a little bit about exporting coordinate systems that we won't have to worry about, but if you were doing other things, you might have to worry about. But I wanted to point out this right here. Um, it has solve subassemblies using, and it that's list component properties or with flexible settings. So for us, this doesn't this doesn't matter because we just have three parts. But if let's just say um, there was a subassembly, maybe uh, maybe the turret and the barrel were a subassembly, um, it would default to exporting them as a rigid body, like combined. And so that, that setting allows you to say, hey, regardless of how I structured my SOLIDWORKS assembly, I can export this as completely flexible or as, you know, because if you, if, it's, if you don't want it to be flexible, it's a pain to control over in SimScape Multibody. Um, on the other hand, if you modeled it a certain way for organizational purposes, it's a pain to unlock all that stuff. So it's a nice, nice setting to remember. OK. Any questions about that? Pretty straightforward, right? So SimScape multi-body link, I go to export, and it gives you a, a choice to go to first generation or second generation. Um, well, it doesn't even tell you about the other one. <laughs> that one is second generation. Um, and that's that's what we're going to do. Um, it's a little prettier, and it's nicer to work with, I think. There's there's some certain things that it trades off, but we're not going to get into that. Um, so we'll click that. <clears throat> we'll put it here. And we'll put it in a subfolder called actual. OK. And I'm going to get the space out of this since MATLAB doesn't like spaces. And it's saving it as an XML file. So I'll hit save. Uh, and you'll notice that it's going to spin up um, the command window for version of MATLAB. So it's, it's MATLAB automation server. And it's going to be working on stuff. Um, you can see it's blinking now. Um, we can't see what it's doing, but basically it's like exporting each of the models individually and writing a little MATLAB script to capture like moment of inertia data and mass data and all that kind of thing. Um, and in just a second, it'll it'll finish these exports, and then we can get over to Simulink and take a look at it. So it says that. Yes, indeed, it has been saved. We'll say OK. All right. And uh, I'll 
this is, I'll just close this. We don't need it anymore. <coughs> this already. We did the export. Okay, now the import. So we use this command, sm import, simscape multibody import, along with the name of the thing that we're going to, the name of that file. So, let's see, where'd you go? Oh, it's out of my. So we'll open uh, my lab here. And then we can pull that in. It's interesting how much, how often stuff like that comes up. You, you wish that everything just worked perfectly, but you know, with the with mate is something that SolidWorks is really has that's really useful. And MATLAB says, uh, I don't really care. <laughs> don't use that. <laughs> you know. Um, it didn't tell me on export. It told me on import. So I, I exported and said, oh, by the way, I don't support that. Um, so it did say which thing, and that made it easy to go find. Um, but it would have been nice if it could have, like, you know, told me before I exported and saved me a little bit of time. Yeah. No big deal, I guess, though. Yeah, yeah. So it's an actual. All right, so there's three files, or four files here. There's the XML file. And then there's <clears throat> this, uh, uh, these step files. Those are the geometry files. And then the XML file is kind of how they all work together and any data about them. So we use that command, sm import. And it's called gun assembly. I'll just hit enter. And so this is kind of a neat thing. It, it builds the, the simulink model for you. Um, and um, remember a while back we talked about how you could drive uh, you could drive Simulink from MATLAB. Well, this is one of those ways. There are actually APIs that you could go write yourself something that made models. And so you can programmatically add blocks, connect blocks, place them, rearrange them, change parameters. Um, that's kind of a different meta way of thinking about it, I guess. You know, like I design things that design things that simulate things. Um, but pretty cool. <laughs> uh, okay. So here we are. Yeah. Um, so let me, I'm going to rearrange this just a little bit so it fits on the screen a little bit better. I'll explain what each of these things are. Okay, so there's this world um, block, which is kind of the, the equivalent of ground in 3D. Um, it's it's a, a reference, and you can see it actually has that ground symbol, right? Earth ground, uh, and that's the that's the world coordinate or world frame. This is the mechanical configuration, so this is where basically just linearization delta uh, and gravity, and here we have gravity defaulting to in the y direction down. <coughs> and then a solver block, which we need all the time. Um, and then we have all these little connections, right, that are physical, and they can push and pull energy. And they have this weird badge thing it looks like uh, a little um, coordinate system triad, right? If you look real close, go zoom in, kind of look like that triad. Um, and those are our frame ports. So remember how we were talking about uh, just briefly how in rigid bodies you talk about how things are connected and it's just a matter of translating and rotating. And so um, it's kind of beyond the scope of, of, to get, of the evening tonight to get too far into that, I just want to make you aware of, hey, go, go check this out, because it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so this, um, this transform says, this part here is connected to the world ground, and I want you to rotate and translate a certain amount off, and then 
there is this port, which is a frame port. And so you connect frame ports, and those frame ports are, are the same node, right? Like from electrical engineering, you guys know this is the same node, whether it's here or here, you know, this port or this port. In SimScape multibody, they're the same frame point, like the same orientation, the same translation. And so what we're doing is, is making a starting point and saying, from the world, we transform out and the base is right here. Um, and so if we look at this real quickly, um, it just has, it has a, uh, a certain, like it's using Cartesian and it's using a particular offset which is defined in a file so we don't have to think about data. We can go open that file but it's not that important. It's just saying, you know, I want this body to be translated and rotated to be here relative zero, zero, zero. Okay. Then, here's the body. Um, and when, there's three bodies. There's the base, the turret, and the barrel. And they're connected by two joints, both revolute. Um, so if we zoom in to the first body, the base, this is actually a subsystem. And here are those connection ports, one that has this reference paint, reference frame, and I, I, I'd love to be able to be able to defend this technically, why it's suggested that you put it here. I don't honestly know, uh, but that's what they say, to put that there. Um, and then there's this solid, which is, we'll, zoom, we'll double click on it, and here's, here's our turret, which is a full, you know, 3D thing, and remember we cut a little door in it so the guy could get out. And, uh, and then it's got all the inertial properties, uh, we can talk about changes in the graphics, and then we can create new frames if we want to. And the frames are those ports. So, so I put in the geometry and then said, make it out of steel. Oh, okay. It figured it out from that. Yeah. Good question. So uh, that's, that's what got translated into Simulink, is this solid body that's referencing some step file so we can visualize it. And then in order to have a connection point that's meaningful and useful, it has another transform and another frame port. So hey ben. Um, that frame port is, you can think of it as the way, as the common point where the top of the base and the bottom of the turret meet. And that's what they both transform out from whatever their origin frames are to meet, and that's where the joints defined. Um, <clears throat> so we go from the base to the revolute joint and then to the turret. Um, so let's just take a look at the joint, because joints are pretty central to, you know, we had stuff in SOLIDWORKS, um, and in SOLIDWORKS, geometry is kind of the, the, main, the main character, right? And, and we work on geometry and get it just the way we want it. But now, we've imported, um, we've imported that model into Simulink, and it's created this model for us, which, which is looking at it differently. And now suddenly we don't care about the geometry because the geometry is just a block that we already created. We're not going to mess with at least unless we iterate it, right? What we really care about is the joints. Um, so let's take a look at what properties there are inside the joint. So it has this crazy long description about joints and then a whole bunch of different things. So um, a lot of these you can go read about the help file exactly how they work. The things that we really care about tonight are actuation and sensing. And so right now, uh, we're not putting in any torque, so it just says none, and the motion is automatically computed. So it's going to look at the environmental situation like gravity and its current degrees of freedom and compute whatever motion is going to happen. Um, and we're not sensing anything. We could sense position, velocity, acceleration, all those sort of things. For the moment, we're not doing any of those. So this is the properties of the revolute joint between the base and the turret. Okay, so if I just hit save here, and I'll just save it, they're done underscore assembly, 
um, and hit play, but aren't you kind of curious what happens if we just hit go and just see? Okay, so let's do that. Um, just falls through because gravity is pulling the barrel down, everything else is constrained, but stuff's going on, right? So this is the mechanics explorer, I guess. And here we can see the different bodies and hide them if we want to. So this kind of looks a little bit like SOLIDWORKS, right? Um, but it has other properties like what frames it's connected to, what its connection frames are, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you wanted to trade out solids or, or whatever. Um, so it's got, it's got the Revolut joints and we can go edit them in here and all that kind of stuff too. So this is how we're going to visualize what's going on because, you know, getting out of of doing stuff in 1D and Simulink, now it's, I mean, think about trying to visualize what's going on as you just, we just have two degrees of freedom, but we're rotating and going up. You know, the way this looks is a little different. If you put it in a scope, right, it would just have this signal that would, well, you get the idea, it would look kind of sinusoidal and you'd swing around a little bit. But You'd, you'd maybe ask yourself, why the heck is it doing that? Here, it's obvious what's going on. Gravity's pulling it down. It's just doing the whole pendulum swing. So, super useful. Um, just a couple of, of things to orient you here. Um, rotate button is right here. So you can click and drag. Uh, pan button to pan around. If you want to zoom in, uh, I think, yeah, left click, up and down. Zooms in and out. Zoom in as a window. So. Uh, pretty straightforward. Okay, so any questions? Yeah. It doesn't do contact because it just swung freely through the rest right. Of the no collisions. Yeah. Is that something we need to fix? I'm not sure if I don't think SimScape multi-body handles collisions. We can make it do things, <laughs> I'm not going to, but uh, just for your consideration, well, let's just defer the question because we can talk more smartly about it later after we've learned a little bit about it. Um, okay, good question though. All right, so we talked about what all these things are, we talked a little bit about frames, we talked about the joint parameters, we ran it. Oh, look, I even have a video. Oh, it's not going to work. I'm proud of my video. You know. <laughs> i got to show you my hard work. <laughs> okay, so ultimately now we've, we've got the geometry in. We know it's got inertial properties. We're happy it looks cool. But we're back to our old game of building an interface for it because we need to actuate it. And we have software that's telling it what to do. And we'll need to know what's going on, so we need some of those sensors too for closed loop control. But we've got to, we want to hurry up and, and control this thing and then abstract ourselves from it because it's complicated. Um, I'm not trying to say I'm scared, I'm just saying why deal with anything messy longer than you need to? Right? Like, there's more problems in the world to solve. So, <clears throat> what our goal is here is to make some ports for this thing we were talking about at the beginning that we can add uh, connection ports that are our physical signal ports. That's what we want to add to this so that uh, it becomes a box with four ports on it. And that's all, because that's all we really need. Um, so we talked a little bit about forward dynamics and inverse kinematics. Um, but let's, let's talk uh, more specifically. So, so once again, forward, forward dynamics is you provide the forces and the torques, you know, you provide the stimulus, and it says, oh, then this is how it would move, there's, there's the response. Inverse kinematics is you provide the motion of prescribing do this, and it says, oh, okay, well, in order for me to do this, I would need blah, 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 torques and forces. And so we're gonna use both of them. Um, and we're gonna do that through joints. And joints is how we're gonna interact with Okay, so driving motion. So let's start with inverse kinematics and set up 
uh, our first joint to, instead of, we'll, we'll leave, we'll make torque none and change motion to provided by input. Um, and that will kind of give us a nice starting point. So I'm just going to do the one, it's easier, so start with the easy one, between base and the turret. So we're going to change our bearing. And then <clears throat> I'll get in here and change actuation to none. And instead of motion being automatically computed, we'll just change it to provided by input. Now, notice there are two ports. When I hit OK, there's a third port. And that third port is a physical signal, but it's not of a particular domain. It's the unidirectional physical signal, because it has that arrow. Um, and we'll talk more about this in a second. But we need to drive this with something. So we grab our trusty, uh, what are they called? Simulink to PS converter. Come on. Right click. There we go. Format. Don't want to show the block name. So I can connect that. And I'm going to put in <clears throat> an input signal of. Uh, degrees, because I'm actuating the, the position that's going to be, but it's a revolute joint, so it needs the angle. And instead of locking it to some specific thing, I've, I just want I just want to see it move, right? So I'm going to put in a ramp. Connect that. I'm going to turn on units. So I don't forget what everything is. That's going to complain about something, but don't worry about that for the moment. <clears throat> um, and I'm going to say this will go 10 degrees per second. So slope is 10. OK, now I'm going to do the update again. And it's going to complain. And it's going to say uh, <clears throat> There are fewer joint primitive degrees of freedom with automatically blah, blah, blah. Um, zero with motion from input, inputs. The prescribed motion trajectories in this component may not be achievable. OK. So this is kind of a similar thing to our, our step input. You know, remember uh, last week we wanted the bottle to start moving, excuse me, instantaneously from holding still to one meter per second. So it's the same kind of complaint. It's saying, ah, that's not quite possible. So I'm going to, uh, just for time's sake, I'm going to filter the input, and second order filter it, 0 0.01, hundredth of a second. OK. So I just, basically, I put a filter in front of that so that we can go to the physical domain and be able to solve the energy equations. Um, all right. So now I'm going to hit go. Oh, did I forget something? Uh, oh. Automatically computed. I forgot. Need to change the slide. So we want the torque to be automatically computed. We're inputting the motion. All right. So now it's sort of blindly turning around. But that's good. That's exactly what I wanted it to do. So if I scrub back, hit go again, it's a nice constant 10 degrees per second. OK, fantastic. But I'm really kind of curious. With all of this massive three-inch blade and this big four-story building that we made, how much torque is that? Any guesses? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> we were off when we were guessing how much blade was. Yeah, yeah. Ridiculous. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna. I clicked on. Let me just. Ten thousand. Final answer. <laughs> That's what I thought. That was my first guess. <laughs> yeah, it's more. Uh, so I clicked on that revolute joint, <laughs> and I'm going to actuator torque and clicking on uh, 
in the sensing portion, I'm clicking on actuator torque. Now notice there aren't any other, there's only three ports. I hit OK. Another port pops up. And I will, uh, let's see, um, I need a physical signal to simulate. Converter. scope in front of it. Okay. Um, and foot times LBF. All right. So I'm going to hit play. Simulate this again. Ten to the seven. <laughs> That's a lot of torque. <laughs> Part of the problem is we needed to get up to speed really fast, right? And we started, bam. But it's nice to keep in mind, ten to the seven. So uh, maybe we don't want it to go quite that fast. <clears throat> Why don't we change this to starting up a little bit slower? So maybe uh, it gets going in. One second, maybe a little bit, a little bit better. Ten to the six, so still up there. Um, and you'd think, like, well, you got it going, isn't that fine? But you got to remember, you're getting it going with torque, and then it's big inertial overrunning load and then you got to slow it down and um, yeah so that's that's what's going on so I'm going to take a little note Let's see. for the turret um, let's see maybe two times ten to the sixth Two E six foot LBF torque. Just for we'll need that for later. Okay, good. Okay, but we don't really want to tell it how fast to go. We want to hook something real up to it and figure out how to make it do what we want to do. That way, we can actually build the thing. Um, and so this is like. This is the good part and the bad part of physical modeling, is it'll tell you what will really happen, and if you make stupid decisions, it will say, I don't think so. <laughs> and so, so there's this iteration back and forth. Um, but for us to get there, um, I want to point out something. So let me just delete this and delete this. Okay, so we are connecting ourselves to this revolute joint, right? But that revolute joint, and we want to have a bi-directional uh, connection to it. But there isn't one. And there's not one, you, you can't make the block give you one. It has a unidirectional in, uh, in this case for, for motion, and then torque for out. And we can change it to be torque input and motion out or velocity out, but they're still unidirectional. So um, conceptually, we have a hurdle to jump over. How do we get this to be bi-directional so we can hook it up to our motor? Because my Simscape has that bi-directional flow. We love that. We need that. But we've got to translate. So, <clears throat> say again? Can you expand on that a little bit? I'm not quite sure what you mean. We've got the two of the two going this way. Revert to it. Well, OK. So you're saying? Uh, think, let me do what I think you're saying. So we're going to give it a torque until the motion's automatically computed, right? And then we're going to sense this, like that. Yeah. 
Is that what you were thinking? I was just thinking of adding another layer of like ports to it. Uh, like so that one goes one way and one goes the other way. But well, I see it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, I, it's it's a it's a problem. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I follow what you're saying, but the block doesn't let us do it. Um, and so, I wish I could say, oh, this is a problem I solved, but it was one of those find an example of how they did it, like it, you know, because you have to be able to do it somewhere, right? Um, so, I want to bring up a slide and let you stare at it for just a second. Okay, so. Take a look at this on the right-hand side. I just won't talk for a little bit. It'll be a terribly uh, boring video to watch on YouTube, but um, there's two unidirectional inputs and two bidirectional inputs. One sensor, one source. Do you see what this is doing? I had to stare at this for a while, so if you guys figure it out in 10 seconds, I'll be impressed. being smarter than me is not that huge a task. Still, I think it's a pretty interesting conceptual leap to bridge the gap. So, any thoughts about this? Three and four are bidirectional physical connections. So that's like you held here and twisted here. And both of them can flow both ways. One is an input, two is an output. One is in speed, because that's what we're going to measure. And two is in is a torque, because that's what we want to put in. But the real the real struggle, conceptual struggle here is what? <laughs> right, like we're 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 trying to get um, something that isn't bidirectional be bidirectional, and I think this is a really interesting uh, conceptual hurdle to to think through, because let me let me walk you through the the concept here. All right, so what we want to put in to the uh, to the joint is a torque. But we need to, quote, feel the pain of that torque, right? Okay. So <clears throat> what we're gonna, what we're going to get out of the joint is the velocity or omega, the angular velocity, um, and that's how we'll feel that pain: stimulus and response. Now, the interesting part here is we're using a sensor for torque and an angular velocity source and connecting their bidirectional conserving ports and then making these two uh, available as outside ports. Well basically um, you, you might, like I say, it wasn't 10 seconds that I stared at this and wrapped my head around it, but it's a pretty fascinating thing that we wanted to actuate torque but we needed physical ports so what we did is combined a source and a sensor together, and this gave us the bidirectional flow we needed. So this is one of those energy balancing points, that it's balancing by sensing and pu you know, pushing and feeling at the same time. Um, so I, that was a terribly unscientific way of saying that, but uh, I, I think... It's, it's, it's one of those things that you'll learn more by staring at it and playing with it than by me jabbering about it for a while. So this is how you do it. Um, and I did try to do this in reverse. In other words, uh, have a, an ideal torque source and, an, and a motion sensor. It does not work in, in reverse. It seems like it ought to, right? But it doesn't work that way. I think it's a forward dynamics versus inverse kinematics problem. But, okay, so... This is how we're going to connect it up. So we have this torque input and omega output. We're going to make this little rotational torque interface, and then we can connect bidirectional sources to it. So it, it sort of sits there like a coupler. Um, I think it's a pretty cool thing, even though it's 
a little bit of a conceptual hurdle. But let's uh, build that real quick. Doesn't take long to build. So I'll okay. subsystem. Get rid of those because we don't need them. We need an ideal velocity source. <clears throat> the neat thing about this too is it doesn't care what the units are because it's handling it internally, um, which I think is also kind of cool. Uh, and a torque tensor. Okay. We connect those two references. Um, and then we just start connecting, making some connector ports. Exactly a feedback. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But it's a different thinking about it in terms of sources and sensors is kind of different. You know what I mean? Like we're more familiar with talking about discrete feedback loops or implicit push pulls in some abstracted signal. But this sort of lays it out and says, here's what you really do. Which I think kind of is like pulling back the curtain a little bit. So we'll call this connection R. Connection C. Connection T. And it's nice that you don't have to worry about ins and outs. I think that's pretty cool. This is W. And then, yeah, that looks pretty good. So now we connect the torque out to the torque in and Q out to omega. I don't know why they call it Q. There's probably a good reason for that. But now we have two bi-directional ports and we have a way to actuate this thing. So let's... <clears throat> let's see. Um, let's make a constant um, and then we'll use how about foot pounds since that's what we used before. And we'll make an ideal torque source. Let's keep this simple right now. Then <clears throat> um, we need a rotational reference. I'll hide the name so it doesn't get ridiculous. Right there. So that's kind of what we're torquing from. And then we need another one on this side. Okay. So was that again? 2E6. That's a lot. 2E6. So let us think. I don't think that'll complain, but I'm going to comment it out anyway. Okay. So now we're actuating that revolute joint. Let's just try it real quick. Remember, we were sensing position. We really want to sense velocity. Um, and I wish it wouldn't do this, but this is just what it does. It had one port before, and now it still has one port, so it left it connected. Uh, it's just what it is. Did, did I do that too fast? Did you guys follow what I did? I, uh, I thought we were uh, sensing torque. No, we're sensing uh, speed, uh, yeah, velocity, angular velocity. Because that's... 
that's the forward dynamics way to do it, right? The stimulus is torque, the response is motion. Okay, so let's save this for a sec and hit go. Cool. And we can expect this thing to. Uh, so in one 1,000, it should be doing whatever that was, 10 degrees per second. But it's going to accelerate because we have a constant torque sitting there moving it forward. So then it gets going pretty quick. Okay, so we're making good progress here. And we're almost to the place where we can uh, <clears throat> leave all the messiness behind us and get back to you know our comfort in circuits. Um, so... We need to do exactly the same thing to this joint, and this is between the barrel and the turret. Let's do that real quick. I want to actuate, provide the torque by the input. That should be automatically computed. I want to sense the velocity. Okay. Very good. Need this to be here. Okay, and uh, just to be You can change the port order, otherwise you can't. Uh, it, it takes a little bit of time, but you can just change which order the ports are in to get uh, W and T on the top, but I'm not going to worry about it right now. And I'll put this connected to R. And um, I want to make, so we need some physical ports here. up with me. Okay, so I'll delete these. All right, so I have one, two ports right now, if I made this whole thing a subsystem. Um, but remember, for closed loop control, we're going to need to know the position output also. So I need uh, one more sensing target, and that's the position. No big deal. I just add one more, and I'll do the same thing here. Position. Okay. So these, all these open ports. As soon as I uh, create a subsystem with this, does that system account for the slowdown for the That's control system design. So right now we're just modeling the physics oh, okay. of whatever we connect to it. Yeah. The revolution to the subsystems when you added the position sensing and changed the connection. I did. It was going to the key. Oh, thank you, thank you. You're right. I was going to complain. Thank you. Yeah. I wish it wouldn't. Just asking for trouble, but it does. Okay, so make a subsystem here by highlighting the whole thing, clicking on that. I'm gonna. So here's we now have a subsystem that now has four ports, which is fantastic. We don't know what they are yet, so I'm just gonna name the ports. This is the turret shaft. No, that's kind of a funny name, but and then this is the. Uh, Turret position. Barrel shaft. Position. Okay. Um, and I kind of like to arrange things so that they make a little more logical sense. So I'm going to put the shafts on the left. They're on the left, which is great. And then the positions as kind of an output, I'll put those on the right hand side just so it's a little easier to look at, which is good. It's on the right. Okay. All right, cool. So, all right, we have labored to produce a nicely abstracted subsystem that has all the inertial properties that we need 
um, and all of the kinematics that we need, how they're all related, so that we can control this thing. So now, let's see if I can catch up with my slides, make sure I didn't go too far. Right. So now we can uh, make the rest of it. And um, so here's the here's this is kind of fun because we can make this as high fidelity as we want or low fidelity as we want. It's just a matter of connecting the dots. And so I'll just walk you through how this thing's connected. There's two sets of all these things, but I just put one in because that's a, a little bit easier to, to uh, think about. I'm going to grab my little pointer because I never get to use it. And I'll look at the big problem for you guys. Cool. Okay. So, oh, it's going to mess up the voice, though. Uh, screw them, huh? I'm here, they didn't come. <laughs> so you got the, the 3D assembly that we just abstracted. And uh, uh, here's all the, all the stuff we've been making so far before the physical stuff is in this box. And, um, or maybe we have some ports or something, but um, this is our commands and our feedback, right? The rest of this is, you know, digital to analog converter, amplifier, a valve, a motor, it turns a gearbox, which is connected to a shaft, and then the board position, there's a sensor, an A to D, it goes back in. Uh, the valve needs some significant power to turn this thing, so we're going to have to have an engine and a pump. So, any questions about this? It's pretty straightforward. Um, so, what we're going to do is just dive into each one of these and make this as simple as we can first and see if we can get the thing to move. Um, and we may, I think we'll just, we'll do the turret shaft first and then we'll copy and paste that to the barrel shaft. And the barrel shaft is more complicated, so um, we, might, we might do that offline. But um, I just, I want, I want you guys to see the zoom in and zoom out of how complex you can make something or how stupid simple you could make it, and either one might be right for whatever you're trying to do. Because you might care about, like just for example, like you might care about uh, what's my current draw on this? You know, because that's going to be dependent on your control algorithm, right? And it's going to be dependent on how fast this moves, so all the inertial properties. And it's going to be dependent on your gearbox ratio, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe you don't care anything about the amplifier, and you say, hey, this valve is rated for two amps. I don't care. I'm working with, you know, 30,000 horsepower. Who cares? Who cares about two amps? Okay, well, maybe the thing we should care about is modeling the engine and figuring out, man, what kind of, you know, mileage are we getting here? Like, <laughs> we're totally training the tanks just trying to maneuver the gun. Um, on the other hand, you might say, hey, I don't care. I, I just want to be able to hit a target which is probably what we're going to do. You say the engine's infinitely powerful. This is virtual, right? So that's, that's the real beauty of this, is to take the part that you care about and, and uh, pull it in. What we are going to do, um, at least for the final thing, so that you can, you can get a sense for this, is make sure that the D to A and A to D are somewhat reasonable, so we don't have infinite precision. So I was thinking 12, 14, 16 bits, somewhere in there. Because there's a finite precision, we have to cross the boundary, and that changes the control algorithm, and that changes the actual final performance of the system. Um, and the rest of it, uh, we'll just kind of see what we have time to do. So, let me get a drink here. All right, so. Um, Nice to be back from a little break. Everyone on YouTube will seem like, wow, you just uh, stopped mid-sentence and <laughs> this is a departure. So this is right after a little break. <laughs> okay, so we want to uh, connect all these up. And let's let's start at the gearbox because we kind of know some of the torque characteristics that we need. Um, actually, you know, we don't know the torque characteristic that we need for the, uh, the turret, do we? I forgot to do that. So let's go back and do that because we kind of need that. We'll get the turret, we need the barrel. 
Oh, you're right. It was the barrel. I'm just looking at time. We've got 45 minutes. It's the same idea. I think we'll skip the barrel. I'll do it offline, and we'll just focus on doing this for the turret so we can control it. Um, otherwise, it gets kind of boring. We've seen it once already. All right, so let's start with the gearbox. Um, so go back in here. Fortunately, let's take a look. There's actually a, a gearbox. I'm not going to use the driveline stuff, but just use the regular mechanical rotational elements, no, mechanisms, and there's a gearbox, which is pretty cool. So, oops, connect it to the turret. Um, and just because we're going to leave this uh, the, the barrel for later, I'm going to put a free rotational free end. So it's just going to allow it to swing. And we don't have to worry about it solving or not solving. Okay, <clears throat> so how much to gear this thing down? Um, and we're, we're just going to kind of walk through not any kind of detailed design process. The goal here isn't to suddenly, you know, convert us from double E's to ME's or something. Um, but in regardless what your your major is or what you're trying to do, the idea of it's the same. Like, okay, we're pushing current through this thing. What's our resistance? We're, we're pushing torque through this thing. How much is it? Okay, so we know we know a couple of things, and we kind of know all we need to know. We know that uh, right now, by itself, we need somewhere in the order of 2 e to the 6 uh, foot-pounds of torque. And we also know that we don't need to turn it super fast. Um, so let's first think about the speed that we want to spin this thing. So a typical uh, hydraulic motor... Did we talk about this that you can just type anywhere? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, hydraulic motor speed, uh, maybe around 3,000 RPM. That's a, that's a pretty, most generic hydraulic motors can do 3,000. And we want our turret speed to be something like 10 degrees a second, maybe. Maybe 20 degrees a second at the outside. One, one, that's pretty fast, actually. Yeah. Maybe 10. Okay, so I don't know if I have to do math in front of everybody. Let's see. So I think I will just use MATLAB to help me, though. So if you have 3,000 RPM, three thousand. And, well, let's go the other way. So, turret speed is 10 degrees per second. Um, okay, true confession, I probably would do neither of these things if I was sitting there by myself. I would probably go to Wolfram Alpha and save myself some time. You guys know about that, right? I uh, had some professors who would say, you know, like, don't use a calculator, or don't use, uh, don't use this, or don't use that, or not a real engineer, or scientist, if, or whatever. Yes, all that kind of wears off when you're trying to get something done, and someone's waiting for you, <laughs> and, and suddenly it's the first person that gets the right answer wins. Um, and it's not that you can trade knowing what you're talking about, but it sure helps to get, you know, a boost when you're, when you're trying to get there. Oh, come on. Yeah, there is. You have a connection. There you are. Convert 
10 degrees per second to RPM. One point six six seven. Okay, so that's good. One point six six seven. So uh, three thousand divided by one point six six seven. That's great because we really like to have something that will multiply our uh, our torque up. So we can we can trade torque for speed, and we want we need two e to the six foot pounds at the at one end of the gearbox. Um, we know that, and it looks like, yeah, so let's do that. Let's put in our 1800 to 1 gearbox here. So, I'll just read this real quick. Shaft and the output are mechanical. I just want to make sure I'm getting it the right way. Input angular velocity to that of the output. So 1800 to 1. That sounds right. So if I, if I say something that does not sound right, I hope you guys stop me because we've been down that path where I've stopped here for five, sec five minutes trying to find a problem. So uh, let's not do that. Um, all right. So if we have increased our... So we want to incrementally test this thing. We don't want to do everything and then hook it, hook it up, right? Um, so we want to be able to test all of all these designs little by little. So this is uh, all, all we really need here is a torque source. Um, but how much torque is the right amount to put in this? Test your physics. Do you remember mechanics? If you, if, well, let's just convert it to uh, let's convert it to electronics. So what's a gearbox? In electronics. Anybody know that off the top of their head? It's a transformer. Oh. Right? Because voltage and current, you're just switching them around. So if we traded, because power is the same through the gearbox, power is the same through the transformer. So <clears throat> our through variable is uh, force, or torque in this case, and our cross variable is velocity. Um, so if we had a transformer and we said, okay, our current, let's see, I'm going to get myself confused. Basically, you just trade the other one. So one is 1,800 to one, one way. So we, we step down our, our, uh, our speed. So that means we're stepping up our torque. Or, yes, our torque. So that means that we need one 1,800th of what we needed before. Let's just double check that. So it was 2E6 divided by 1,800, which is still pretty big, but not nearly as big. 1.11E3. That's 11, so 1100, yeah. So it's about 1200 foot pounds. That's not so bad, right? Uh, so, oh, I don't want to search. Torque. Okay, so let's just put that in and see if we get kind of the response we're expecting and um, if we do then we'll be happy. So what do we need? We need a torque source. Ideal torque source. Connected there. And we need a rotational reference. You ever sing when you're uh, building stuff? <laughs> or hum or anything? <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, Simulink PS converter. I was reading a reading a doc a uh, website today about night owls versus morning larks. I think they call them. Morning larks. I've never heard of that before. But. <laughs> uh, do you guys know what what you are of the two? Definitely night owls. Yeah. Same. Same with you, Gary. It depends. If I have school, 
<laughs> Seems like a bad combo. <laughs> It seems like they, the article was saying that engineers uh, tend to be, or not engineers, but creative professionals tend to be night owls, which is interesting. Um, and there's like, not that there's a right or wrong, just I think that was kind of cool. I am definitely a night owl. Okay. 1200. I <laughs> totally, totally, I feel you. Okay, then we need a PS. Actually, let's just uh, let's just run it. And we'll watch the animation. Okay. It's always scary when it doesn't run. That looks reasonable, right? Even though it's accelerating, but at least to start with. So we're not we're not crazy yet. Okay, so if we go back to the slides, we have a gearbox done. Now let's put a motor in there. So <clears throat> we want a motor that can do 3,000 RPM, which isn't any big deal. We really, in, uh, what's the word? Uh, the thing that we need to make sure it can do is to have a reasonable torque at a reasonable pressure for the hydraulic motor. So Again, uh, if hydraulics was your thing, then you might go about this differently. But since I'm willing to bet most of us not, uh, let's just play with it. Um, but in a, in a separate little deal. Um, and this, I, I, you may be different than me, but I've found that when I don't know how something works, I go play with it. And I go break stuff. And, and this is a great place to break stuff, right? People don't get as mad, so, and I and I've you know it's funny. I think I've said this before, but like all the times that I don't go simulate it, I break the real thing, and it's so frustrating because I simulate stuff so often, um, and then like the only time I don't, I'm like, nah, it's fine. <laughs> Eighteen hundred bucks, dang it. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, what was I gonna do? Oh yeah, we want twelve hundred foot-pounds of torque at 3,000 PSI. So let's grab, go to fluids, hydraulics, isothermal. We want a motor, hydraulic motor. <clears throat> so we'll turn it at a reasonable rate. So we want, I keep deleting that, but I need it. All this same things. Oh. <laughs> Forgot. Not yet. Um, yield velocity source. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna do a super low res simulation off on the side and figure out what kind of motor we need. Simulink to PS and I'm gonna run this thing at three thousand RPM. Let's see. Constant. Come on. Three thousand. This is in RPM. Good. <clears throat> That's how fast we're driving this thing. Now we need to get rid of the ground, so we need a hydraulic, oh, come on. hydraulic reference. And then, okay, so we want this to push a certain amount of torque at a certain pressure. So all I want is something that allows me to check that really fast. Um, so what I'm going to do is hold it to a pressure and see what the torque is. Um, so I need a torque sensor. Torque sensor. The 
which should go right back here. This torque is a through variable, just like current, so it's got to be in line. Oops. And then PS to Simulink. And I want to put a display here so I can see what it is. Okay. And now, <clears throat> so this is going to tell me what the torque is, but I need to try to push over a particular pressure. So uh, in order to resist, so basically I need, I need a resistor in a hydraulic sense. Um, and I'm going to use something that will resist me up to a particular pressure or a pressure relief valve. Uh, so what is that? Valve, pressure control, pressure relief. Do. So this is just going to resist up to a certain pressure and then it will let it pass. So the, oh, this, is the, this is the size. Uh, I have no idea, so I'm just going to make it. Four inches. It's probably way too big. That's okay though. I'm going to make it a four inch diameter port and I want it to operate at 3000 psi and everything else is good. Take my word for it. Alright. Alright. And okay. So our question is our only question is to figure out what's the displacement we need for this motor. So I'm going to change this to centimeters per revolution. So that's something I think in a little bit better. Cubic centimeters per revolution. Oops. And I don't really need to go for 10 seconds, 3 seconds would be plenty. And uh, let's try 80 cc's. No, oh, I forgot the solver. Okay. Always got to have a solver. 229. Okay. How about 300? So we need a 450 cc motor, which we now have, copy, paste, flip it around, cool, okay. Um, what's next on the list? Oops. Okay, so next is a valve. So the valve, we don't have to worry about too much. We really just want something that can open and close and have enough flow for us. Um, so we can put in, for our purposes, any old valve. <clears throat> um, we did talk about directional valves last time a little bit. And we want, the only thing we really need to be careful about is A, B being blocked when they're uh, at center so that we can hold it. That's especially important for the turret because if we couldn't hold the pressure, the turret would just fall down to the deck, right? So um, really all we have to do here is make sure that we can push enough oil through, which no problem. Um, I don't know. Two inch porch. I'm just, uh, yeah, so five centimeters. The rest of the stuff, so you get the idea. I mean, the valve, not not a big, other than getting it the right size, that, that's the only real thing we have to size. Um, okay. And the next on the list is, so we've got gearbox, motor, valve, pump. Okay, so... Now we know how, how do I say this? 
we know the displacement of the motor it's going to take to drive our gearbox, right? But now we need to know the flow of that same motor when it doesn't have much load. So, because we need a displacement for the pump. So we can gear it up or gear it down or whatever we need to do. Um, so we can switch over to that little test guy and do something a little bit different. Let's just make it go, instead of over 3,000, let's make it go over 5. So now it just has to go over 5 PSI. And this time, I would like to monitor uh, flow rate. How fast are we pushing stuff through there? Is my question. And a PS to simulate converter. Okay, and display. Fifty-six gallons a minute. That's quite a bit. Um, so, I'm just thinking about options here. Um, we know that it's going to take three thousand psi for our maximum torque, and so when we size the pump. <coughs> Let's think about it from the engine standpoint. That's what we're bridging. We're always thinking about bridging things. So engines typically, like industrial engines, typically run in the 14 to 1800 RPM range. Like if you think of a big rig or gen set or something like that. And so we're going to be needing to run slower from the engine standpoint and faster on the motor. So we actually need to be about twice the displacement on the pump because it's being pushed by an engine that's running about half as fast. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> yeah, we didn't need to run the flow thing. I was going in a different direction. That didn't, didn't help us a lot there. Uh, so we'll make a pump, and this was 450, so we'll make the pump 900. Let's go find that pump. And I'm going to keep this simple and make it fixed displacement. This be kind of a dumb way to do it because you'd be, it's very energy, uh, <laughs> when you're not using the valve you're just wasting horsepower <laughs> if it's fixed displacement. That doesn't bother us because this is virtual. So, But again, you know, maybe when you go back and want to make something more high fidelity, you decide, oh, that, that matters to me. And you make it variable displacement or pressure compensated or any of those things. So that's good. Now we actually finished our hydraulic circuit. That's all done now. Um, so now we need an engine and I want to make our engine pretty straightforward. I think I'm just going to use a, a rotational an ideal velocity source for the moment. Oops. Simulate, yes. Yeah, that's the way we're talking about it. Okay. Good. I kind of forgot to try this, didn't I? Oh, we'll try it now. 1600 RPM. Doesn't yes yes it does but um, it also needs something else. The valve also needs something to tell it to turn on, like to shift. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. So this 
be in centimeters. This is how far we're shifting the spool to make a turn. And uh, we'll turn it all the way, which is five centimeters. It's kind of the default. Okay, and that's Change input handling to filtered. Isn't it terrible? I tell you guys, that you should definitely use your uh, build your own filter, and then I never do. <laughs> and it goes to show you when you're in a hurry, you do what you gotta do. Okay, so I think that's everything. Let's ask Sam Link. figure out what's going on. We do need to add a pressure relief valve to this thing. Oh, you know, I don't think we actually made this the right displacement. Nope, we didn't. So 900 centimeters cube per revolution. That'll help us a lot. Actually push some oil through the circuit. And we need a pressure relief valve, which will open PSI. And we don't hurt anything. And there we go. Yeah. Cool. So, and you know, notice about this, if we run this, oops, if we run this for like, I don't know, 100 seconds or so, um, it's not going to just take off because we already figured out how fast it wanted to go and we have an engine pushing it. And so it's, it's not going to keep accelerating like our ideal torque source would. Um, so that's pretty cool. Now, I guess the proof's in the pudding. You know, that's that's the cool thing about this stuff is is it really doing what we thought it should do. We wanted it to go about 10 degrees per second. Well, let's hook up a sensor and see if that's what's really happening. So let's do that very quickly. Um, turret position. Okay, so we need a PS to simulate converter. This is going to be in degrees. And then we'll take zero order holes. And we'll look at it every, oh, I don't know, one over 100, 100 times a second. And we'll take the discrete derivative. All good, and the scope on that. So this should be close to 10. Let's see if it really is, though. So you can see it jogging back and forth, and we wouldn't get that if we were just doing four, uh, inverse kinematics. But this is the actual speed we're going as it does this and shivers, you know, as it, the inertia takes over, and then pressure comes back, and we go over relief, and that valve changes the pressure and the torques. So that's that's pretty cool. And this is something that we can close the loop on, and we can control the valve with. Okay. So we've got time for one more thing. Um, I cannot help myself, but I think, let me see. 
when I when I look at these, so so we we skip the amplifier. We just said it's going to be open, right? And we we made our little sensor, which just converts and it's per currently infinitely uh, precise. Um, so A to D's and D to A's are basically the same thing in reverse, right? So which one are we going to make? Um, I just want to make that's the last thing we'll make today, an A to D or a D to A. Okay. So from analog to digital, um, we're going to be on the sensor side of things. Oops. Wanted that. So uh, why this is important, like I mentioned before, is that everything has um, everything has a certain amount of error, everything has a certain precision, and there's always a certain amount of noise. And so when we model stuff like this, uh, I was thinking about my thesis project, and I didn't model the first time. Have you guys ever heard of model predictive control on an MTC? It's, it's a cool thing. It's, you know how PID controllers, you guys are kind of familiar, heard of them? Um, so that's like the most, uh, it's the most common type of controller, P or PI or PID uh, or PD. Well, MP, but, but they're kind of steering, it's like people have compared it to uh, driving down the freeway looking through your mirror because you're only looking at what happened because it's a feedback of where you were and then where you want to be. So you're like, oh, I should have made that turn, you know. <laughs> And so, the, anyway, for my thesis project, I couldn't accomplish it with that um, because I had some strange dynamics, hysteresis, and other things, nonlinear materials. And so I, I approached it a little differently with this thing called MPC, which is Model Predictive Control. And when I first plugged it in, and I had a Kalman filter, which estimated things that I couldn't measure, and then this MPC controller, and, uh, you know, after I got the thing breathing, and I, I showed my... Um, control consultant uh, friend that was helping me, um, hey, check this out. And he's like, you're done. Like, that's awesome. That, that gets all of the control, um, you know, you passed all the requirements. And then I was like, okay, sweet. So, you know, where's my medal kind of a deal. Um, but I hadn't, what I hadn't done is two things. I had not injected noise and I had not injected the finite uh, conversions. So I had 16-bit converters, about 100 millivolts of noise on 10-volt signals. And so, and mostly white noise, but it's still noise. So you don't know exactly. So, you, so my point is, when you go model stuff, and you're in a nice, I would say, kind of clean environment, and we're trying to make this realistic, it's really, really, really important. Like, if you want the real thing to match, you know, Semper Fidelis, if you want it to be faithful, you've got to mimic that stuff that's present, that's always present. So uh, enough pep talk, that's, that's why it's important to me to say something about an A to D. Um, so uh, let's say that this is delivering, uh, just for time's sake, what's the, okay, let me put this on you guys. What's the most important part would you guess, um, of an A to D as far as the model goes. So think about, about an A to D, about what are the characteristics of what it takes in and what it puts out. What's, what's the first order effect of the A to D? Like, if you had to model just one thing, like you kept cutting different things off, what would, what would it do? What's functionally its... It converts from analog to digital, right? Mm -hmm. but, but what does that mean? It's taking in discrete time samples. Yeah. Of your analog input. And? Uh, giving them additional output interpretation of that. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's the key. So we did our little zero order hold, right? So there's the discrete sampling. So I might just uh, cheat and take this and this. And say here's the beginning of our A to D. So there's our, there's our discrete sampling. So it quantized it in time at 100 hertz. It also quantized it in level because it's a finite precision right, uh, conversion. So there's a certain number of bits. So 
lots of different ways to do this, but the easiest one is a quantizer. And it's asking, uh, that's not the way I want to talk about it. Hmm. Okay. Let's say, so when we take stuff in, I forgot this, is, I, I forgot I had to build them. That's okay, they're, they're easy. Um, this is, the quantizer is, is taking in a parameter of a certain step size, right? So think with me, when you're talking about a, uh, an A to D, what are the other characteristics of it? It has a particular range and a particular bit depth, and that implies a certain step size, right? So let's, uh, let's, let's build that in. So if I sample this, let's see, 360 degrees, and uh, 16 bit, 14 bit. We want to hit the target. Let's go 16 bit. Um, so 2 to the 16th is like 65,000 something. Somewhere in that neighborhood. 65,000, yeah. Um, equals approximately. Does that work? No. Okay. So that means if we can measure our full 360 degree position um, that, and we convert that to a 16-bit representation, that we're going to take 360 and divide it by 65,500, right? <clears throat> 360 by so, yeah. Um, well, I'm in MATLAB anyway. I'll just say 2 to the 16th minus 1. Yeah, you're right. I'm just, as long as I'm here, might as well. Okay, so that's saying. <laughs> what's that? Oh. <laughs> well, this is a good idea. We'll uh, format. Uh, isn't it long? I want to say it's long. Now we got some precision. Okay. So I'm going to call that quant, and I'm going to do this. Mask, create mask. Range in degrees, range and oops, bit depth, bits. <laughs> Call this <coughs> bits. A smarter person would have done this the first time, but that's okay. Uh, so I want quant to be equal to range divided by. Two to the bits. Oh, minus one. Call that bits, right? Yeah. All right, sweet. 360. So now we can play with these as parameters for our A to D. And we have a uh, we can change our, our sampling rate and our bit depth, and now we have a more accurate A to D, or I should say more faithful, less accurate A to D, and that handles quantization. And the same thing you do in reverse, you just, um, well you guys are smart people, you can figure it out, but same idea, you're taking a quantized level digitally and going somewhere so you'd have to think about snapping to integer numbers in that range, moving that way. So, uh, the only thing we haven't done is 
uh, put these in nice little blocks. Um, but I guess I, I just I want to I want you to stop and look at this and say, you know, what do I care about, or what should we care about, or or whatever. When and, and so that when you're working on the model of your own or your senior project or whatever it is, and you say, uh, you know, all no gearbox has perfect meshing, right? Well, there's a really cool thing we could do. We could say this is a subsystem, right? And this is not a perfect connection. There's something called backlash. But backlash is a simulink thing, not okay. Well, we can create those interfaces again, bidirectional interfaces that work with simulink. Or I think there's some stuff in the sim drive line that you know it's another toolbox that have backlashing for gears. But you see what I mean? Like once you have this thing and it's working, now you kind of want to. Well, I don't care about this. I do care about this. And you zoom in. You zoom out. And that's that's where I was uh, coming from with the um, uh, fidelity. Um, you know, increase it until it's enough for whatever it is you're doing. Start with something that's off the shelf. In our case, it's in the library. Drag and drop. We're done. And we can decrease it if you know if, if it doesn't hurt us. We can just leave it there. But otherwise, if it costs us runtime. So last thing, I promise. Uh, before we before we call it good, um, <clears throat> with this, if if you had to take this whole system and um, you, you haven't really had enough time to think about it because you're just looking at it the first time, but um, if you had to take this whole system and say. All of this really means blah, you know. Um, that was terribly. That was a terrible way to say that. <laughs> let me let me try to recompose my thoughts here. <laughs> I want you to read my mind now. Okay. Um, we have all this complexity in here, and that's by design, right? We wanted to see the push and the pull and the hydraulic part and the gear part and the torques and the speeds and all of that. But maybe that takes too long to simulate. Or maybe you don't have any confidence in your parameter values, or whatever. What would you have to know about the system in order to create a controller for it? Ah. <laughs> Projector went off. Yeah. Well, let me save the suspense. So. The big deal here is that we have a ridiculous amount of inertia, right? We have three inch plate and it's this four story building of it. And so you could take all of this and say, I don't need all this fidelity, right? Maybe you model this up, you figure out what your uh, second order transfer function is equivalent to it. And you could, you could I'm sure you could look up online and or if you're in signals and that stuff's fresh in your mind, whatever, like go, it's not fresh in my mind. <laughs> so, uh, say, well, what's the second order transfer function of a mechanical system that has this inertia? And sure, you'd be trading stuff, but it would run a heck of a lot faster. So that's what I'm trying to say. Like, we've been zooming in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, backlash of gears and meshing losses and blah, 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 pressure losses. Uh, you know, A to D characteristics, you could zoom out and say, second order system, it's got a lot of inertia, not that much uh, damping, you know? So, um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll, we'll end there. Next time, I'll finish the other side. The, the other, the other, the turret thing is just going to be the same thing, slightly different values. Um, and I'll wrap some controllers around it, and next time we'll see if we can hit something. So that'll be fun. I'm really curious if we can hit something because I haven't wrapped it yet. So we'll see. <laughs> so anyway, thanks for the attention.